Mark Pakel is our speaker today, and uh, we welcome him. He's been a member and a very active member, uh, contributing a great deal, especially to our web presence, um, being our, um, uh, the in our internet provider, among many other things, and offering a lot of support in that regard. Today, so Mark, I believe, is the, um, what is it, the... Uh, sort of the Pope of the Church of Reality, is that, that's, that's sort of what you are. So Mark is going to basically tell us today, um, give us the Bible for our moral lives, and the issue of right and wrong will no longer be a problem for us from this day forth. So, Mark, welcome. Thanks. Hello. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, it technically it wouldn't really be the Pope of the Church of Reality as much as the Jesus of the Pope of Reality or the Buddha of the Purple Re for Church of Reality or the L. Ron Hubbard of the Church of Reality, you know. But um, anyhow, my, my talk today is about, you know, science is the new Bible and, and basically it's about where moral authority comes from and what is right and wrong in a scientific context in, the, in an atheist world. Is, is plenty, uh, most all of you know, you know, when you discuss uh, morality and moral authority with your religious friends, you know, they'll say, well, we have moral authority. It comes from the Bible. The Bible is the word of God, and what's in the Bible is right, and what's not in the Bible is wrong. And, you know, then they come to us, you know, atheists, humanists, and stuff, and, you know, we say, well, we don't agree with that, but you know, what do we have to point to where moral authority comes from? Where does right and wrong come from? So that when we face questions about things like um, capitalism versus socialism versus communism and um, whether or not things like domestic spying is right or wrong and why do we care, we need to have some type of a, uh, an authority, some, some type of an infrastructure to say, what, what's good and what's bad in, in a, a universal context. So, um, and, and the reason that this question has sort of eluded the atheist and humanist community in a lot of ways is because the religious world is never going to get there because the religious world believes in magic and you're, you're not going to get into a reality-based solution by starting from a, a magic perspective. And the scientific community hasn't ever gotten there because the scientific community is basically afraid of the question. They say, well, that's a religious world question. And in, in, in the world of science, you know, the consensus or, or, or the easy answer has been there is no such thing as meaning in a universal context. There is no such thing as right and wrong in a universal context. We're here for no reason at all. We just simply exist. And this is just one little planet in a great big universe, you know, that perhaps is teeming with life. And if a big asteroid came and wiped us out, the universe doesn't care. And although that's the prevailing thought, it's a thought that I disagree with because when you think it through, there's things about it that doesn't make sense. Um, that, you know, the, the, the assumption that humanity has no value or that anything has no value basically undermines science itself because if nothing has any value then why do science? Why do we want to explore the universe in the first place? Why do we want to know what's out there if, if there isn't any value, if there isn't any um, you know uh, sort of a, a universal reward of some sort, you know, in, in, in exploring the universe and continuing to exist. So, the first thing I want to do is try to talk about looking at this from multiple perspectives. Because um, most people think in terms of, I am an individual, and because I'm an individual, I'm looking at it from my point of view, and why is this stuff important to me? Um, and I don't think you're ever going to get to the answer to that question if you, if you look at yourself, you know, the, the, look at it from only that perspective. Because there are multiple layers of perspective to look at your personal identity from. For instance, I am a collection of atoms, you know, most of which are arranged in molecules. 
So I could look at it from a bigger perspective and say I'm a collection of molecules. But then I could take it up a scale and say, well, I'm a, a colony of cells, of which only 10% are human cells and none of the rest of them are various bacteria and other types of microbes that live inside this body. You know, and that doesn't really express who I am as a person. But in, a, in another way it does because it's accurate to say I'm a colony of cells. Now, of course, of that colony of cells, not all the cells are involved in understanding and, you know, contemplating the question, you know, I, I think, therefore, I am. So one might say, well, my, my brain cells are the most important cells because they're the ones that give me identity and, and not all of them are involved in that. Some of them are just, just involved in keeping my heart beating and breathing and other type of things, you know, to keep the, you know, the feet going so that the brain can walk around and go to different places. So in, in some ways, understanding the brain from the perspective of maybe a single brain cell would be very difficult to understand because one brain cell can't really contemplate the whole brain. So then we get to the order of, okay, I'm an individual, I'm a person, I've got this brain cell, and the, and the, and the network of brain cells all working together create a consciousness, and I can then learn and I can talk to you, and you know, that makes me me. But is that really the appropriate scale as well? Because when I tell you things like, the universe is 13.8 billion years old, and I know that, and you know that. What do we really mean? Like, how do we know that, you know? I mean, is, is, is there anybody in this room that's measured the age of the universe? You know, no, we don't know it. We know it because we trust other people who know it for us. And we're all part of a larger network, a community, a colony of humans that make up, you know, uh, an inf intellectual infrastructure that allow us to know things that our individual minds don't know. You know, we, we all, you know, believe that E equals MC square, but, you know, who in this room has actually done the math and calculated the formula for and, and understand why that's true? You know, there's probably a few people here that might have done that, but the rest of us take it on trust that E equals MC square because we know that all the scientists and the smart people who know these things know that E equals MC square and they know that it's not E equals MC cubed. Now if I came in here and said, well, we just discovered that E equals MC cubed and we were cubed and we were wrong about E equals MC squared and it's because Stephen Hawking says it's so. You know, we might say, oh, Stephen Hawking, yeah, we believe it, you know, because if Stephen Hawking says it, you know, he, he knows it, you know. But we know that through him. So, in a way, you can really, you know, a more accurate way is that we are part of a much larger structure that includes all of humanity, and we um, uh, share uh, a much larger consciousness and, and intellectual infrastructure where our brains are networked together that allows us to know the age of the universe, it allows us to know physics, it allows us to know chemistry, it allows us to know electronics, something that no one individual could know. If, if, if you took any one of us and stuck us on a desert island, even one that had plenty of food, no predators, and a good climate, you know, where we might live to a, a ripe old age, you know, that, that individual would die off, you know, because it at least takes at least, you know, two people, you know, to reproduce. And if you got one person, you go extinct. So just as our brain cells are part of a network that creates our individual consciousness, our minds are part of a greater network that, that, that creates a, uh, a larger being for which we are part of. And that larger being that we're a part of includes everything that it takes for us to survive, just like our bodies need our stomach in order to feed us and our lungs in order to provide us oxygen and our heart in order to keep the blood flowing. You know, we need, 
the bacteria, we need plant life, we need animal life, you know, things that uh, take in, you know, you know the, create the environment for which, you know, it takes for humans to survive because if we wiped out every other species on the planet and except for humans, we, we, we would quickly run out of food. If we, if we got rid of all the plant life, you know, we would soon run out of oxygen and the planet would go back to a carbon dioxide atmosphere and all animal life would be gone. And we know that some 3.8 billion years ago, um, and, and this may not be entirely accurate because we don't know all the details, but some microbe, you know, down in the bottom of the ocean, 3.8 billion years ago started splitting and that microbe is still splitting today and we are all, all life on earth is still that single individual that's still splitting. And if you look at humanity from the perspective that we're one individual that contains this vast amount of collective knowledge and that we're still that, and we're continuing to survive. It's a much more accurate way to uh, develop the, the concept of morality from that perspective than from the individual perspective. Because if you're one person, if you're the last person on earth, then there is no morality anymore because morality has to do with the way we interact with each other. So, so, so when you, when you look, also when you look at that way, it explains things like, why do we care about each other? Why do we, why does a person die for their country? You know, it, it's, it's not, you know, good for me to die for my country. I'm gone, you know, why do I care? You know, when I'm gone, I'm gone, you know, universe goes on without me, you know. But, you know, people take care of their children. Why do you care about the next generation? You know, it's because that, we're not individuals, you know, we're still that one larger individual that is continuing to grow and reproduce and, and thrive as long as we collectively make the right decisions to continue to where we don't all go extinct. And, you know, the first big asteroid comes along, it blows this planet apart, it's all gone. So, in order to stay around, you know, we need to be able to do the things it takes to continue to be part of existence. So, now taking the thing to a larger level, we know that 13.8 billion years ago there was a big bang. And the, we don't know why there was a big bang, and we don't know why anything, you know, there's, there's things exist as opposed to there being nothing, but this process of the universe started 13.8 billion years ago. And 13.8 billion years ago, there was no matter. It was all energy for the first 300,000 years, as I understand it. And then when the universe cooled off enough, you know, then you, you started having hydrogen and helium atoms precipitating out of the energy. So energy decomposed into matter. And then we had, you know, two gases, two hot gases in an expanding universe and gravity started pulling these gases together and forming stars. And when stars formed, it created a process that where a, a fusion where the, these lighter elements fused into heavier elements and then we got carbon and we got oxygen and we got iron and, uh, in, uh, and uh, as it moves up, you know, and then um, at the end of a star's life, you know, uh, and in larger stars, they collapse in a supernova, and in a, a fraction of a second, the star explodes and it forms, you know, all the heavier elements past iron and kicks it out into the universe where uh, gravity comes together, starts forming rocky planets and new stars, and planets like ours, I believe, are the second or third generation of uh, solar systems, so it took some, several, many billions of years, well, it took 13.8 billion years to get here, our planet is four billion years old, so when the universe was, you know, nine billion years old, you know, our solar system began to form. And in the process, you know, even though the universe itself doesn't have a consciousness, there are processes and properties of the universe 
that um, have led to greater and greater complexity. You know, we started out with energy, then we had matter, then we have more complex molecules, and then we have planets, you know, they're made out, you know, we have, you know, out of these heavier things. And 13, or, or 3.8 billion years ago, you know, chemicals came together in the sea somehow and life started to form and life became more and more complex and somehow through the properties of evolution, life evolved into us. So one has to ask oneself, you know, of course, things like, you know, is this happening in other places in the universe? Is this the only planet where this happens? And if it's happening in other places in the universe, how would that life be similar and different from life here? And what would be its properties and so forth? Um, so basically evolution is, is, it can be described in a simple form as randomness that selects on survivability. So that which survives makes the right choices, gets lucky, continues, that which doesn't survive is weeded out of the formula. So if, if, you, you know, if, if you do the wrong thing or you fail to do the right thing, you're not here anymore. You know, when, when people wonder, well, why did the dinosaurs go extinct? The, the correct answer is because they failed to develop a space program. You know, if the dinosaurs had developed the space program, they might have seen that asteroid coming and be able to send something up there to deflect it and they'd be around and we wouldn't be. And the important thing to learn from that is that if we don't develop a space program, then when the next asteroid comes around and it will happen heading to this planet, it's gonna wipe us out too. But as we develop our technology, we're at the point where if we see that asteroid coming, all we gotta do is give it a, you know, long enough away, all we gotta do is give that thing a little shove and it's gonna miss the Earth. I mean, this Earth is going around the sun at 66,000 miles an hour, and if we can slow that asteroid down five minutes, you know, when it's coming, the Earth is not going to be there when it comes across our path. It's going to come in behind us, and it's going to miss us. And we can do that if we know it's coming with today's technology. Now, if we see that asteroid, it's three weeks away, and it's heading straight for us, we're screwed. But if we see it, you know, like uh, there, there's one coming around in 2029, it's called Apothos. And Apothos is going to come by and it's going to graze the atmosphere. It's going to come that close. And when it grazes the atmosphere, it's going to go off on a, a trajectory that we don't know what that trajectory is. And that's going to come back in 2036. And in 2036, if it grazes the atmosphere just right, it's going to hit us and it's going to wipe us out. Now, the probabilities are very small. I think, you know, NASA's saying one in 45,000 that it's going to come back again and hit us in, 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 in 2036. But after it comes past in 2029, we're going to know at that point whether or not it's going to be on a path that's going to hit us in 2036. And we're going to be able to go up there and we're going to be able to give that thing a shove. It's going to miss us. And that's going to be the, the thing that determines whether or not humanity is going to still be here in 2037 or not. Because we developed the technology to deflect asteroids. Now, when we talk about things like, uh, you, know, you know, why we want to be here, well, wh why does the universe care? It may be that the universe has a certain property to it, that, 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 that's called emergent properties. Emergent properties is things that when you get more and more complex, properties and things emerge that you never thought of before. Um, and, and we know most of us, you know, here, you know, we're, we're, we're an older crowd, R remember the days before computers or before computers were significant. And as computers developed, you know, we can see the evolution of computers as sort of like a, a fast track on, uh, on where things are going. You know, you know, computers evolved in our lifetime. You know, we saw it from the early things all the way to now. And 
we started noticing, well, we had individual computers and those computers became smarter and smarter, but when we started networking those computers, when we started letting those computers talk to each other and communicate with each other over the internet, then we had a whole other level of emergent properties because you can take a million computers and put them together and you have Google. And Google is a deity by the standards of, you know, most cultures, you know, when, when you ask Google a question, it gives you an answer, and it's often right. So even though it's not conscious, you know, when you type Google into Google, it finds Google, you know, that seems like it's self-aware, you know. And as time goes on, computers, you know, there's going to be more and more emergent properties that come from the fact that, you know, computers are evolving along with us. And when I talk about us, you know, I'm not talking about just the, the biological, you know, some of the biology of, of the planet, but also the some of the technology of the planet. So our computers, our airplanes, our machines are all part of who we are. You know, humans live twice as long as they did 300 years ago. And it's not because of an evolutionary change, it's because you know, our software has evolved, you know, because biologically we're identical to people 300 years ago, but people couldn't fly back then, and people can fly now. People back then couldn't live in outer space, people now can with no biological change. Yet we have these new abilities because we have evolved and there, we have evolved through the sum of all our knowledge, which is what I call, you know, the, the tree of knowledge, which is the sum total of, of all human understanding. And we're all part of that tree. And we have an afterlife in that tree. You know, as, uh, you know, there's a gentleman here this morning that before I came up, you know, who eulogized a, a friend who they cared about. And he, he came up and he told her story about who she was and how she affected, you know, the, the, the world. Well, her effect is that the, 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 the sum total of her life from the moment that she was born until the moment she decide, died was her story. You know, is this, the, your story is everything that you do from the moment you're born to the moment you die. And then after you die, your story lives on, you know, in the tree of knowledge because it affects how, you know, how you affected society and what you contributed to the world lives on beyond you and it becomes part of, you know, what humanity is. You know, Einstein is still with us today because E equals MC squared is still with us today. So when we look at morality, we got to look at it in terms of existence. You know, what is it that allows us to continue to exist into the future and what, what is that purpose? And if we move our uh, view of identity that, that the universe evolved into us, of course it evolved into our planet, it evolved into our solar system, it evolved into our galaxy, and all the things that are in the universe is what the universe evolved into. That, you know, at, the, at least in this little corner of the universe, we are the brains of the universe. We are the consciousness of the universe. And since you know, we are the universe, or a piece of it, we're the piece of the universe where the universe contemplates its own existence. If there is no other life in the universe, this here on this planet at this time is the only point where the universe became aware of itself because we are the universe contemplating the universe and the universe has become self-aware. And I think that eventually we're going to realize that the self-awareness of the universe is an emergent property of the universe based on whatever formula the universe runs under. You know, we seem to be working in, in some type of a mathematical universe, you know, that where, you know, everything uh, applies to it. And, you know, there may be, we may discover there's an equation that started this whole thing, and we're just that equation playing itself out. And, you know, so, so in order to, you know, so, so, and, and we're just at a point where we're just waking up, you know, it's, it's almost like we're a newborn baby that just found its toes. We know that there's a universe out there, we know how old it is, and we know very, very little. So, 
it, it just seems to me that you know, maybe we should allow this thing that we're part of you know, to continue the path that has been going to learn more, to grow up, to continue to exist, and to see you know, what's the end of this, what happens when this thing becomes an adult. So, um, so if there's this, this, this pattern, you know, just like an asteroid, you know, it's like, how do we know if an asteroid's gonna hit the Earth? You know, we need to know two things, because we, we, in order to know its future, we need to know where it is now, and we need to know where it's been. Because if we looked at this exact moment, you know, we saw an asteroid, all we know is where the asteroid is. We don't know where the asteroid is heading. Now, as if we let some time progress after we find the asteroid, we come back the next day, then we see where the asteroid is tomorrow, which is, you know, now today, and we're looking at where the asteroid was yesterday, we're looking at where the asteroid is today, and we're going to know where the asteroid's going to be tomorrow. So, on the same thing, if we look at where humanity is today, and where humanity has been, you know, we can see a trajectory of where humanity seems to be going, and we have to ask ourselves, you know, do we want to stay on that same trajectory? Now, you may ask yourself, you know, well, why is this all important, and why do we need to know this now? And the reason it's important, the reason we need to know this now is because uh, evolution has, has is, is, is taking uh, a, a new turn, you know, there, there's a new emergent property that's happening in the world of evolution and that property is that we're going from an evolutionary model based on randomness that selects on survival to an engineered form of, uh, of evolution. We are at the point where we're going to be able to sequence DNA and we're going to be able to change our DNA and we're already doing that, you know. It's, and some of the stuff is like easy stuff. Okay, somebody has a defect, you know, that causes color blindness. So we, well, we say, well, seeing color is better than not seeing color. We all seem to know that's true. So if we can fix this gene and people can see color, well, you know, we're not changing DNA, we're just fixing it, you know. So we start fixing the defects and then we discover hey, if we make this one little tweak on this gene, we can give somebody double the vision that they have now. You know, you can see twice as far, twice as sharp. And then the question is, well, why not do that, you know? Why not tweak a gene that makes us smarter? You know, and when we get to the point where we can fuse in genes from other creatures and we can, you know, we have a computer that can calculate this, we can manufacture custom life forms including superior human beings or superior human hybrids. And when you mix in technology with that, you know, with uh, cybernetic implants and connecting our brains directly to the internet, instead of, you know, I mean, I'm connected to the internet through this device in my pocket here. You know, this is, this is half my brain right here. And many of you have one of these things too, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Now, this would be much more convenient if I didn't have to carry it around in my pocket and look at it with my eyes and play with my finger. If I had this thing inside my brain, you know, wow, that would be great. You know, I would know where I was, I would know directions. I wouldn't have to remember anybody's name anymore. You know, I would know everybody's name on the planet, what their phone number was. You know, I could do, you know, you wouldn't have to learn math, you know, it's right here, calculus, right in my head. And there might even be things like, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, doing something that might be stupid. You know, I don't have to figure that out myself. There's an app for that, you know, I could access that. And, and all of a sudden, you know, I get information about all the people who've done the stupid thing that I'm about to do. And it comes back and says, you might not want to do that, you know, here's the information, you know. And, and that's going to be a whole different paradigm, and we're about to go into that world. And in order to go in that world where we're going to build the, the creatures that are, we're going to build the next generation, we're going to engineer the generation, of, you know, the, the, our replacements, they're going to be a lot smarter than us, they're going to be part machine, and, and you know, in an engineered paradigm, the question is, is 
where do we go and why do we do it and how do we make those kind of decisions? And in order to do that, we have to understand what is humanity and what is our place in the universe? And what is our purpose? And that's hard to do, you know, when you're an atheist and you don't have an omnipotent purpose giver telling you what to do. So we, we basically we have to reverse engineer what humanity is to figure out what we are, where we're going, and where we should go so that when we look back at this day, we say, hey, we made the right decision because we took the time to understand where we're going and who we are before it just happened to us, before you know, the, the choice was made by some corporation or some corrupt government because we could turn into something really terrible or we could go extinct. And if we go extinct, we're out of the game. And then everything that has happened here on this planet becomes meaningless it becomes nothing and we can hope that maybe there's some other planet in the universe that gets it right and does what we're supposed to do. But we don't know. The universe might go back to being a dumb universe if we get wiped out by an asteroid and there's no intelligence in the universe anywhere anymore. And is that a risk that we want to take by making the wrong decision? And since we've been looking up into the stars, you know, with our SETI telescopes looking for extraterrestrial life and we're seeing nothing at all you know, we at least know that intelligent life is extraordinarily scarce and that humans in the form we know now will never see, you know, individuals from any other planet. If we stay along around for thousands of years more and we continue to evolve, maybe someday we might get out there and we might run into somebody else from some other planet or some other galaxy or something like that. But as of today, we're not seeing anything. And if, there, if life, intelligent life in the universe were, were, were common, we would be seeing their electromagnetic signals. You know, we would be seeing you know, sophisticated electromagnetic noise everywhere. And if, um, you know, even though this galaxy is big, it would only take about 250 million years for an intelligent species to colonize this galaxy. So if somebody were just a mere 250 million years ahead of us, this galaxy would be teeming with signals. You know, there would be signals everywhere, but there's not. And that sort of, you know, is an is a indicator that we might be the only ones in this galaxy you know, at least there's nobody who's 250 million years further along than we are. So that makes what we are valuable if, you know, in the context is if, if, if anything has meaning, then that has meaning. Now, it, it's difficult, you know, for atheists to talk about meaning because, you know, people's mind thinks, well, if, if, if there's meaning, if there's purpose, there's got to be a deity, a purpose giver you know, that made that purpose, you know, but I'm suggesting that there might be a sort of a broader definition of what purpose is and that uh, purpose is sort of can come from the idea that, you know, that a universe that we don't understand has somehow evolved into us and that we're here now contemplating that and that we may be part of some bigger structure that we don't yet understand but because we don't understand it we should at least assume that we should continue to stick around long enough to understand it so any purpose that we have has to include the idea that we're going to continue to exist that there's basically two paths that we have for our future we can continue in the direction of positive evolution and understand more and more about reality in the universe or we can go extinct. And if we go extinct, we're out of the game and that's the wrong decision. You know, and in fact, that is the definition of the wrong decision is anything that leads to extinction. Where the definition of the right decision, whatever that is, must at least include our continued existence. Now, in order to continue to exist long term, you know, as we all know, we're going to have to get off this planet at some point. We all know that, you know, in the next few billion years that the sun is going to turn into a red giant. We're going to become part of the atmosphere. We're going to spiral in and we're going to end up in the core of the sun. And if we're still here, we're not going to be there here for long, you know. So we have to get out into space and start colonizing other planets at some point. 
And uh, we don't have to do that tomorrow, but in order to do that, we're going to have to know a whole lot more about reality than we know today, you know. So the understanding of reality and the expansion of what we know about the universe is mandatory if we're going to stay in the game. So in order to do that, we have, since we understand reality collectively, we have to collectively have a society where we, you know, we have peace, we have freedom, we have, you know, inv a good, you know, take care of our environment so we don't go extinct, and we have enough free time, you know, what I call telescope time, to s look out there and figure out what the universe is and expand our knowledge. And if we don't do that, we're not going to be here. And that becomes a universal standard for morality. It becomes, you know, the basis for what's right and wrong. And so that we can claim that we have moral authority because our moral authority comes from the structure of the universe itself. And that we need to learn how to live, what I call, and I didn't invent this, this term, this term was invented by my friend Michael Dowd, you know, who is my, my reality evangelist, that we need to learn to live in right relationship with reality. And if we don't learn to live in right relationship with reality, then the angry hand of Darwin is going to reach out and strike you down. <laughs> so, so when we have questions, see that now, right now, what, you know, what, you know, here we are, humanists. We're trying to wonder, well, what's right and wrong? You know, I'll give you an example, of something that's currently in the news. You know, okay, when Bush was president, if Bush did something, it was what? Wrong, exactly. Now, Obama's president, if he does something, it is right, exactly. So we know what's right and wrong because if Bush did it, it's wrong. If Obama does it, it's right. Now we have a situation where, you know, Obama's doing something that Bush used to do that we thought was wrong, and it's like, wow, my moral center is gone. You know, we, we did all of a sudden, it's like, I don't know what's right and wrong anymore. You know, if Bush did it, Obama's doing it, it looks you know, on the face of it against the Constitution, but Obama's not Bush, and it's like, whoa, you know, this is so confusing, you know, and half of the liberals are like, I'm sticking with Obama, you know, it must be right, you know, and I guess we were wrong when we thought Bush did it wrong, and then you got the constitutional people that look at, you know, the, the NSA spying is what I'm referring to, and they look at, you know, the NSA spying and they say, well, this is obviously wrong because the Constitution said, has the Fourth Amendment and there's no way in hell, you know, the Fourth Amendment means that it applies to every single person in the world, you know, is, is a criminal and needs to be investigated. You know, that just doesn't make sense. So how do we determine what's right and wrong in a universal context? Well, we got to say, well, you know, if, if humanity has an Orwellian society, you know, that's wrong because in an Orwellian society, you're not going to have people going out inventing things and, and exploring the universe and so forth. You're going to have people hiding from the brown shirts, you know, so they're not executed for doing the wrong things. You know, if you text the wrong person the wrong thing, then a, then a drone comes, you know, and, and to execute you and tracks you down by the cell phone in your pocket. That would be wrong. And the reason that is wrong is because it, it's, it's a process that leads to our extinction where if we have the kind of society where we have a process that leads to our positive evolution, then that gives us, you know, a framework from which right and wrong evolves from and gives us a way to determine, you know, which direction we should go in. The same thing with the argument, you know, we had this a couple weeks ago, as capitalism versus socialism versus communism. You know, do we want to have it to where everybody gets the same amount of money regardless of any, you know, how much work they do or how lazy they are or anything? Or do we want to have uh, you know, uh, Darwinian you know, uh, capitalism where it's all survival of the fittest and you know, if, if you don't have it together enough to survive, you know, if, you don't, you know, if you show up at the hospital with no money, then you die and the weak die off and the strong populate the earth and, 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 and society gets stronger. And, and, and of course, the correct answer is somewhere in between. And the way you gauge it is, is by saying, you know, what is it, you know, the right balance, you know, to reward the people, you know, who, you know, invent things and make society better for everybody, you know, but yet, you know, have, uh, you know, some type of a floor 
for which you know everybody's safe and protected, you know, so that if you get sick, you're not going to die before you, you know, you know, have a chance to recover and invent that new next great thing. So it, it gives us a way to answer the rest of the world, you know, and, and gives us a, a, a way to create a migration path, you know, so that these people, you know, in the religious world out there, you know, we want to convert to our reality-based world. You know, we, we need to give them an upgrade path, you know. So the upgrade path is that um, the Bible used to be science two, three thousand years ago. That was the best they could do because they didn't have science and they were trying to explain the universe and that was the best they could do back then. Now we have a much more modern way of looking at that, you know. Same thing too, they wanted to understand, well, how, why are we here? What is our creator, you know? Where do we come from? And we have an answer to that too, you know. They thought, you know, there's this thing called God, you know, and God was the logical conclusion 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. But now we know. So now the universe was our creator, you know, and just like they, we're trying to understand our creator just like they're trying to understand their creator. And science is the new Bible, and, you know, it's time for them to upgrade to version 2.0. And, 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 and have, a, you know, a, 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 a philosophy that is based in reality that, that, that is the right philosophy because if we, of course, the right philosophy be, being to learn to live in right relationship with reality so that we're still here so that when we're still around long enough to figure out, you know, if there's some bigger goal that, you know, that humanity's purpose is, that we're still here to realize that. So at this point, you know, since we know very, so very little about the universe, but we know enough to where the universe is self-aware, you know, our minimum goal has to be to continue to exist. So anyhow, um, we started a little late, you know, I wanted to take about 35 minutes to talk and 25 minutes for questions, so I think we're going to be about on time. So I'm going to open it up now for anybody who wants to ask anything, give you plenty of time for questions. Well, okay, there's a process here. You're noting them down, right? Um, emergent properties of universes. You went through emergent properties as looking for meaning and goals and directions and I have observed that emergent properties as we define them, things that appear out of order and feedback, are feedback properties. And for there to be a consciousness other than the feedback in our brain, there has to be feedback properties. And in this universe I don't see a lot of feedback other than uh, light signal and optical, so cons other consciousnesses at other levels. Okay, well, you don't have to give that to me. Uh, for all we know, we may be the only consciousness here. And we got here through emergent properties, and I can't say that I or anybody else, I think I'm losing it, there we go, I or anybody else understands that process so all I'm saying is, is we need to do what it takes to continue to be here so that we can get to the point where we understand that process more. You know, the, the, the concept of, you know, emergent properties is, is something that, you know, has only existed in, in the last century as compared to the last 13.8 billion years. You know, we're, we're, we're an infant. This is an infant um, species. And we're about to evolve into something else, you know. In fact, you know, I look at humanity as a parent species of some other species that we're going to end up engineering that's going to end up, you know, we're going to become that or it's going to replace us or there's going to be some process where life as we know it here on this planet is going to go away and it's going to be replaced by something hopefully that's better. And the only way that we can make sure that what replaces us is better is if we understand who we are, where we're going, and, 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 and figure out what better means 
so that we know that we're on the right track as to what is better. Okay, next. Um, I think <clears throat> so I had a question. You, you said um, the universe has become self-aware. I think that's what you say, right? Um, so I guess I, I don't quite, well, I, I don't agree with that. I mean, firstly, I guess you have to look at the words self-aware and universe. Firstly, it's my understanding that the self and self-awareness is something that's a property of our brains and minds, at least that's what neuroscience, I don't think self-awareness exists beyond our brains and minds. And then when you look at the universe, the universe to my mind is a concept we have and a model within our minds for reality. We don't really know what reality is and we certainly don't know that self-awareness or consciousness exists there. So I, I guess I don't buy that. I mean, I, I accept that we internally to our brains are becoming are self-aware and that's a property of our individual brains but I, I don't see that you can extend that beyond the, beyond the animal brain I don't think okay, the universe well, has that property and, and, and I'm not oh. I'm not you know and that's the that's the problem with I, I always struggle with in trying to explain these things so I'll, I'll try to explain it is what I mean by this because I am one of the things I'm not saying is that there's a consciousness out there in the universe that's external to us that's doing this I'm saying is that the universe evolved in us, we are the part of the universe that thinks. So the awareness of the universe is our awareness, not our individual awareness, but our collective awareness, that humanity is aware of the universe collectively and that we're figuring out the universe collectively and we are the brain cells of the universe at this point. And of course that's excluding life on other planets where there might be other brain cells of the universe but whatever I say about this planet if there's life on other planets everything I say applies to life on other planets too you know they got to move when the big asteroid hits them they get wiped out too I don't know what their physical structure is what they realize but I can tell you that big asteroids are bad for advanced life anywhere in the universe you know I'm just gonna make that assumption but, but, but the, when I think of the universe and when we all think of the universe collectively, we are the universe and the universe is reali contemplating itself through our brains, not through an external consciousness. Next. Hi, I'm Marie. You said that we need to understand what's going on so we can be sure that things will be better. And I guess my opinion is that better is so subjective. My opinion of better might be totally different than Mr. Obama's opinion of better or whatever. I, I, I guess I just feel like whatever will happen will happen and more or less it will be determined by who is the strongest and the most creative and the cleverest. And um, whether it's better or not. Who knows? So well, I'm curious about that. Okay, uh, let me use you know, Korea as an example of what, what's better and what's not better. Korea used to be one country, now it's two countries that made two entirely different decisions. One, the North Korea went in one direction and South Korea went in a different direction. So what's better has to do with the choices that were made and if we make the wrong choice, we're going to evolve into North Korea. If we make the right choice, we're going to evolve into South Korea. So, in order to make sure that we make the right choice, we need to understand who we are, where we're going, and that these choices aren't all equal, and that there is such thing as better, and there is such thing as better in a universal context. And by understanding that, uh, that positive evolution, that we have two paths, either extinction or positive evolution, that if we keep on the path of positive evolution, then we'll be South Korea, and if we go on the path of you know, extinction will become North Korea because if, if, if the whole world went away except for North Korea, North Korea wouldn't survive. North Korea is dependent on the welfare from the rest of the world to keep it going. And we don't want to do that. So, so we can look at, you know, positive evolution, not just surviving, but thriving as, the, um, as our compass, you know, that points us in the right direction so that when we have the choices of what we need to do on a daily basis, you know, we, we have something that guides us in the right direction. Next. Hi. Oh. Well, I feel that your talk was fascinating. I, one of the best I've ever heard in the 11 years that we are coming here. 
how you uh, how you evolve from the atom to the galaxies with rationality and the steps match each with uh, even the moral conclusions you know the only objection I have, I wouldn't see the Bible as the ancient science, you know. I believe it's a bunch of fairy tales, you know, that evolve parallel, and with these fairy tales they want to brainwash us, you know, since childhood. So I believe parallel with the creation of the Bible, which obviously was created by, by men, not by God, you know, the primitive science evolved separately. The Babylons were good astronomers, they observed phenomena that could be reproducible. The Bible cannot be reproducible. You don't create a new Christ that happens the same way with the Christ that existed. So that's my only objection. It has nothing to do with science. It's, it evolves parallel with the ancient science. Yeah, I, I understand that. Um, and and I, I'm being somewhat generous, you know, to the people back then, but Whoops, uh, don't lean on that, uh, just set it down. Um, th there was no science back then, science is a recent invention. But you had people who were trying to understand the universe and they basically, their way of understanding the universe was they would sort of make up something in their head that would sort of make sense and sort of, you know, be along the lines of what seems to work in society. It's, in fact, part of it was evolution because there were a number of different religious myths, you know, way back when, and, you know, different, some of it, you know, battled it out. They became models of society, and those things where it worked, you know, tended to dominate over the stuff that didn't work, you know. So, you know, even though Christianity is wrong, for instance, Christianity got a lot of things right. And the reason that it got things right was because of evolution. It's because that if, if they got too much wrong, they wouldn't be here anymore. So, so you could sort of look like look at religion and God as something that was, you know, was was science created by evolution. You know, but now we have evolved to the point where we can put together the, the network infrastructure that it takes to make real science, you know, and, and to us, the stuff that we assume, you know, that, you know, like testing and, you know, uh, blind testing and, and, and peer review and scrutiny and stuff like that, that, those things didn't exist back then. And they did the best with what they had to work with. So I'm, I'm basically giving them the, the benefit of the doubt, you know, and say, you know, and it also creates a migration path. You know, when I talk to religious people about you know, well, you know, why should I, you know, upgrade to your reality, you know, and say, well, it's because this is a continuation of the process that was started back then. What you need to do is stop looking backwards and start looking forward to the future and realize, you know, that, you know, we evolved from that to this, and this is the 2.0 version of what, you know, people were doing back then. It gives people a migration path to migrate from the religious world into the reality-based world without, you know, looking back and saying, you know, this, what you had was evil. Because I, I don't think it started out as a deliberate attempt, you know, to, to, to mislead people. These people really did believe that was true because there wasn't anything else out there to believe. It was the best they had to work with at the time. You know, the thing is, is that now we know, we know better, just like... You know, we, we used to believe that Newton, you know, had it right, you know, and then Einstein came along, you know, and gave us a much deeper understanding of physics than, than Newton did. Well, was Newton wrong? You know, yes and no. You know, he was, he was right in, in the context that he applied, you know, that it applied, but he was wrong in the much larger, you know, context. So Newton, you know, was state of the art, you know, and I'm, I'm basically ready to say that the Bible was state of the art science, you know, 3,000 years ago, which was, you know, a, a world that was so primitive that we can't even imagine what it was like, you know, to live in a world without science at all. Next. Okay, Mark. Oh, is this thing on? Oh. Hey, Mark. I, I, I'm Carl yeah. here. Yeah. Okay. Carl. And, um, you know, I, I'm trying to push this in my own mind, okay, I see the Bible as a collection of empirically evolved wisdom. Now, wisdom is empirical. It is not no, it's the same thing in the same class to me as know-how. You know how to do something, but you don't know how it works. Knowledge is knowing how it works. Now, to me, science is the knowledge part. 
there's a lot of stuff floating around in the Bible that does not contain knowledge. Right. But maybe it has a collection of stories which people thought made sense to them at the time. That's what you're talking about. Right. Today we have a whole bunch of stories that scientists put out that they all believe collectively at the present time, but they may change their mind about. Right? Yeah, well, we have a process, though. What's yes. new isn't what we know, it's the process that we know it by. You know, we have a, 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 the scientific process keeps refining knowledge and making it more and more true as we learn more and more things. Without that process, knowledge wouldn't increase. Well, I, and then the only other thing I'm confused about is I, if the title of your talk had been something else, I'm not sure what it was, holy books or wisdom books or something, because it could, does the same thing apply for Buddhism? Does the same thing, and I do not think it does. Does the same thing apply for um, uh, the, um, the Quran or L. Ron Hubbard's Wingdings or whatever it is? I'm not necessarily sure those all fit in the same class. Maybe you could have called it a different title than Bible. Well, you know, I mean, personally, I think, you know, that Buddha got it more right than than the Christians or L. Ron Hubbard did. Um, and, and interestingly enough, Buddhism is moving toward reality. The, the Dalai Lama has, 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 has called for a, a, a secular version of morality that's based on science, and he's having his monks go out there and learn advanced, you know, scientific stuff in order to, you know, he's heading in the direction of the Church of Reality, you know, and. Uh, so there, it's all sort of evolving toward reality, you know, it's just that I came at it from the other end and I got there sooner because I started closer to the goal. So, you know, Buddhism still has a little bit of woo in it, you know, and they, they a little bit of magic, you know, and so it's, they're sort of like giving that up, you know, and moving toward reality. And for a while there, I thought the Catholics were doing that too, you know, a few weeks ago when the Pope made a statement that maybe atheists go to heaven, but then the Vatican walked that back, you know, so, you know, but, uh, but as knowledge increases, you know, everybody's going to be moving toward reality in the long run as long as we don't destroy civilization in the short run. So, I don't know if that answered your question or not, you know, but uh, these were all, you know, early attempts at, you know, understanding the principles and the, and the, the morality of the universe. Because if you have a society, you have to have a reason, you know, say, well, this is the law. Well, why is it the law? Well, because God says so. Oh, okay. Well, I'll go by the law. And if it's, you know, if the law makes enough sense, you know, where the civilization survives, you know, if they happen to guess the right answer, you know, that corresponds with reality, those civilizations are still here, you know. So, you know, the fact that there's wisdom in these religions that are still around doesn't surprise me because evolution caused that. Okay, next. Hi, Mark. I uh, liked your talk very much. Um, and just to continue with the question from before, uh, I thought I'd offer here, uh, a definition of uh, science that I learned recently, which says uh, science is anything you do to make predictions more accurate than you can uh, do by chance. And what's nice about that is it cuts uh, cleanly without having to worry about process or uh, method, scientific method or anything. And in, w under that kind of a definition, you might uh, include, you know, Aristotle and, and, and people who thought in the, end, in the ancient world uh, in a way that allowed them to make predictions accurately. Uh, and that would be the lineage, I think, that you're trying to describe. Uh, from ancient time to now, which is a continuous evolution and improvement in predictive ability, right? And then I guess it's valid to, to, to note that some of these ancient texts, uh, religious texts, weren't very good predictors then and aren't very good predictors now, and so maybe we can categorize them as something other than science. Yeah, well, you know, a, a lot of the things that we believe today are wrong. You know, in the future, we're going to realize, you know, how primitive people were right here today. So, you know, I, I have a little sympathy for Aristotle and Newton and, and, and even the people who wrote the Bible, the Koran and, and the Buddha. You know, these people are all searching for the answer, just like we're searching for the answer. And, but one of the things that, you know, like, like you said, you know, we have a, a process and we have a goal, you know, is to find methods that separate when we have, you know, information 
where we can pick out the truth from what's not true. You know, so it's a matter of discerning truth, you know, and the study of reality itself, of course, you know, is the, you know, the ultimate, you know, method, you know, that, that we, we make reality uh, a holy thing, you know, the, uh, almost a religious thing, you know, that our commitment to reality, even though we might be wrong about things, you know, if we, you know, make a commitment, you know, to put reality first, you know, that, you know, thou shalt not have no other realities before thee, you know, other than real reality itself, then that will keep us on the right path, especially when it, in, it includes our continued existence and understanding reality, you know, that, which is what I consider to be the purpose of humanity is to be the method for which reality contemplates itself. You know, we are reality contemplating itself. As long as we stay on that path, we will grow, and if we get off that path, we'll go extinct, and maybe something else will come along and replace us, but that that comes along and replaces us has to do the same thing that we need to do in the first place, regardless if it's this planet or any other planet. So there really is only one path if you're going to be part of existence, and that's to become reality understanding itself. Otherwise, you go extinct. Next. Hi. Um, I ran into one of the libraries in San Mateo County into a book that I started uh, reading, and it's called Time Management for the Creative Person. And in one of these chapters, well, like he does in all of the sections, he put a quote from some famous person. And in this one, it reads, it's uh, the chief function of your body is to carry your brain around. And that was by Thomas Edison. And I was wondering uh, what you think about that statement of Edison. Well, you know, that's an interesting statement because, you know, if your body is to carry your brain around because your brain is your consciousness, then, you know, the, um, if you take it to the next level, the, uh, the, the purpose of us individuals is to support the, 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 the geniuses, you know. In, in, in our society, the people who know stuff for us, you know. A, a, a couple years ago, I met a guy down in Santa Cruz, you know, who I you know, was told was a, a famous physicist, you know, and I went up to him and I said, oh, I hear you're famous for something. And his name is um, um, uh, Joel um, uh, Primack. And um, he said, yeah, he says, well, you know, you, you heard about the standard model of the universe and dark energy and dark matter and all that stuff. And I said, yeah, he says, I'm the guy who figured that out. And it, it, it turns out he was, you know. And so I met the guy, you know, who understands the universe for all of us, you know. Now, you know, he started now, other people who, who followed him, you know, they all understand the universe too, but he's the guy who did it, you know. And our job, you know, the guy who picks up his trash and the guy who brings him his cable TV and the farmer who puts food on his table are, are like the body that's supporting the mind, you know, you know, so that he can figure out the universe for all of us. And that applies to, you know, anybody, you know. So, so we're all part of one large work organism you know, some of which are brighter minds than others, you know, but we have a collective single consciousness that contemplates the universe because no one person here could do that on their own. It's just impossible to do with a single brain any more than one brain cell could contemplate the mind. Next. Uh, I see that, <clears throat> what I see is that religion is uh, uh, developed to answer the question why. And it's stuck with an idea of uh, a godless, a, a god. And everything that came along was always answered by saying, well, God did it, or because of God. Science, to me, wants to know what is happening, how it's happening, and, without, and can always change and, uh, according to new information. Right. And I think that's the very basic difference between, because religion is always, always has that same uh, answer. And it hasn't learned anymore other than why. And right. That's why I call science the Bible 2.0, is that it, you know, it's, it's the, the 2.0 version you know, has the feature that it's forward looking instead of backward looking and that it can change you know, to respond to what you know, our understanding of reality is as opposed to being fixed. 
So 1.0 religion was, was, was fixed information, 2.0 is evolving information and, and that's why you know you, you want to upgrade from 1.0 to 2.0. Next. So I'm trying to get my head around your explanation of morality. You seem to be saying that choices that lead to survivability are the right choices um, for our survivability and it seems like how you define our is crucial to that, right? I can endorse yes. slavery by saying there's us and there's them and it's best for our survivability if we have this parasitic relationship with these people who are not us. And currently there's a lot of genetic uniformity among the human race, but if you're talking about in the far future where people are doing genetic engineering and stuff, how does that definition of morality continue to function? Well, okay, there's got to be a couple aspects. As it, survivability is the first aspect, you know, is that we got to continue to exist because if we don't exist, we're out and that's the end of it. Now, the other thing is, is that in order to continue to exist, our understanding of reality has to increase over time. So if we get to the point where we're stable and we're not learning anything more, eventually something's going to come along and get us and we're going to cease to exist. So the right path has to include curiosity, for example, it has to be programmed into, you know, if, if we evolve into the Cylons, you know, we become a machine-based race, that machine-based race has to want to be curious and want to continue to improve itself, you know, and never get to the point where, you know, reality sucks so bad that it would rather die. So, and, and, and any further than that, I haven't figured that out yet, you know, but, but those are the, the few things that at, at the early stages of understanding this that humans are at this point that I can say that this is universally true. And, but I think that if we can, you know, get our heads around this concept that we can come up with a lot more and we can have a much deeper understanding and that we need to do that now before we evolve into machine form. And if you look at what's in your pocket and you realize that the cell phone in your pocket is more powerful than all the computers in the planets were on the planet 35 years ago and you think 35 years from now, you know, that people will have things in their pocket that's greater than the sum total of all computers on the planet now, that at that point, you know, you got to realize that an emergent property is, is that machine is going to be self-aware, is going to be alive, and it's going to have its own agenda, and we need to figure out, you know, where we're going before that happens in order to thrive, so. But, okay. but the answer to the question is, I don't know, but there's like a couple things that I figured out and we need to figure out more. Next. Okay, well in fact, um, I think we need to eat to survive and lunch is ready, so I'm going to make a moral decision. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Lunch is ready.